Hello, 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 and welcome. Stephanie here again, and welcome to episode 92 of the Rent to Rent Success podcast. This is a diamond for you today. There aren't many people who are specialists in supported living. It's the thing that everybody wants to know about right now. And so I'm delighted that sharing the podcast with me today is Bianca Andrew. Now, Bianca has become a friend of mine. We met through Clubhouse. We met in person at the weekend. And Bianca started and scaled her business to six figures in nine months. That's the power in supported living. But as Bianca will tell you, she does have a lot of relevant experience as she's been in social care for 15 years. She started as a buy-to-let investor 20 years ago, and that's a phenomenal story that I know you're going to love as well. And she's a mum, property investor, business owner, and she also helps people get started in the complex world of setting up your own supported living business with the rent to rent strategy. So there's so much we're going to dive into today. Welcome to the podcast, Bianca Andrew. Thank you, Stephanie. How are you? I'm really good, thank you. And I'm so excited for today's conversation. People ask me about supported living all the time. It's the new sort of, I don't know if you call it trendy, but everybody wants to know about supported living now. But before we actually dive into the topic of supported living, I know your story. So I'd love you to talk about, tell us a little bit about you first. Okay, so as you've told your your audience, my name is Bianca Andrew. Uh, <laughs> I've been a buy to let investor for the past ten years. I always describe myself as a very vanilla buy to let investor because I barely do anything to the properties that I purchase. I like them kind of ready to go at the most, a lick of paint, <laughs> and then hand the keys over to an agent or you know however we're gonna go forward with finding tenants. So I've been doing that for the past 10 years alongside working in a nine to five. Um, I come from a social care background. So that's what I've done for all of my adult career. Um, I've worked in various uh, settings, including prisons, probation service, drug and alcohol teams. And I've now very recently started my own business which is providing an accommodation and support service to young people going through the care system. And as you said, using the rent to rent strategy in order to conduct my business model. So that's me in a nutshell. I love it. And but but I, I'd known you for quite some time before I realized actually how you started off. I, whoops, I said 20 years, but it's 10 years ago. <laughs> um, but um, you started 10 years ago. And you were young when you started. Tell us about what your situation was when you first started investing in property because I just love that story and I think people will take so much inspiration from it. Yeah sure so um, I've always been a saver I've saved money from you know the days of getting pocket money from family I never ever ever spent my own money <laughs> and um, yeah so I've always been a saver throughout university I had savings and I was always saving for this rainy day um, I came across the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, as I'm sure you'll hear many entrepreneurs uh, talk about. I came about this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I was actually in the process of buying a property to live in. So it was going to be my first property, my first residential property. Um, I'd had an offer accepted. We were going through the legals and I got to the end of Rich Dad, Poor Dad and thought, oh my goodness, I'm going about this in completely the wrong way. Why am I going to take on a liability when actually what I should be doing is buying something that's going to generate an income? So I actually pulled out of that deal, much to the distress <laughs> and annoyance of the letting agent he, uh, or the sales agent. They they were frantic. They couldn't believe that at that stage in the day I was going to pull out. But I pulled out of that and then set about looking for an investment property. Um, you know, it cost a little bit more because obviously if you're buying something to let, you've got to put down a bigger deposit. I literally put every penny that I had into that deposit. And I had one pound left in my bank account by the time we had completed. I paid my agent fees and, you know, conveyancing fees and everything else. That one pound was purely to keep the bank account open, not because I could afford to have that one pound in the account. 
But anyway, I knew that buying an investment property was going to be um, a positive thing because it was going to give me some money um, at the end of the month once all the um, expenses had been paid for. So that's what I set about doing. I didn't really have anyone around me to kind of guide and direct me. I had one friend who was like, he was very, very simplistic in his kind of approach to it. Is your is your rental income going to cover the mortgage if the answer is yes buy the property <laughs> and so that's what i did um you know at the time i was living in social housing which was fine i had more than enough space for me and my son i was a single parent i was studying i was working my son was two at the time and he was in nursery and i thought you know even if i um don't get myself out of living in South East London in Peckham. <laughs> Even if I don't ever move out of where I am, at least when my son grows up, I will have something to hand over to him and get him kind of a step ahead. That was really the, the goal. It wasn't anything more than that. So I went ahead and bought the property and then I caught the bug, as you do. <laughs> you buy a property, you, you know, I haven't had to do anything to it. And then within two years, it was literally two years and four months later, the capital appreciation on that property had grown so much that I was able to take £80,000 out. And as they say, the rest is history because I've just grown the portfolio from then, really. Um, so it was never part of the the wider plan to become a portfolio landlord i just wanted to have a property to hand over to my son um i caught the bug and <laughs> continued continued uh, in the buy to let space oh my gosh there's so many things i i love about that story every time you speak i'm, I'm scribbling here because there's so many things that i want to draw out and, and call upon but there's almost too many but so one of the things that I love about what you said is you read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and immediately you implemented it. Yeah. You were quite far the way through the purchase of a property to live in. You abandoned that process. I'm guessing you lost some money in doing that. Yeah, I mean, just a little bit, but it, it seemed to make sense at the time. So I was happy to do that. So you lost some money doing it. And then you bought an investment property in Peckham. And this is 10 years ago in 2011. Yeah, so, it was Lewisham, South East London. Lewisham. So tell us, if you remember, mm -hmm. how much did it cost to buy a property in Lewisham? Okay, so it was a newly converted um, flat, two flats in the building, a share of freehold property, two bedrooms, open plan, living room, kitchen, and a really nicely done bathroom. Um, I've got the first floor, somebody else uh, got the ground floor. It was on the market for 160. I tried to make an offer, but the, <laughs> but the vendor wasn't having any of it. So I paid market rate 160. And that was in February 2011. I love that you remember the actual month. Yeah. So in February 2011, you bought that property, you stretched yourself. Can you remember what the what, what percentage the deposit was or how much you paid for the deposit? I put something in the region of 30,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 30,000 pounds for the deposit. I, I did have to pay stamp duty as a first tie. Oh, or did I? Or was it because of the value? Oh, gosh, now all the details are blurred. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I can't remember. Yeah. So, so you've got you've got the property. You've paid thirty grand. You've got a pound left in the bank, but then you've got this asset. And then, not only are you getting cash flow every month, as your friend said, but in two years, that property then gave you eighty thousand pounds that you wouldn't have had. So, if you were just paying the mortgage on your own property, as you worked out for yourself. That property would not have given you 80 grand two years later yeah so it's just mind-blowing when you think about it like that and that's where you caught the bug so tell us a little bit how did your portfolio go on from there bring us bring us up to the current day but we'll stop short of the supported living okay so um so after releasing 
that amount of money. I um, Circumstances had changed for me. So I was no longer a single parent. I was married. I've got a lovely husband. And um, I had given up the social housing property uh, once I got married and moved into my husband's home. Um, the the reasoning or the rationale behind that was that we would save loads of money and we would obviously then go and buy again. We didn't even think about, you know, releasing equity from my flat. Um, you know, it just it just wasn't something that we thought about that flat was there in the background giving a nice little return um you know we'd moved in together we were now married and we were saving up because <laughs> we thought that was the best way to do it we were saving up to then buy another property um the, uh, 2013 the market was pretty much how it is today it was really 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 hot people were over offering on properties prices had gone sky high it was just crazy so we were living in east london in Leighton, and we were looking around and trying to get a two or a three bed house and it was just impossible it was like I don't know, prices were well into the 300 and we weren't really getting that much for our money. Mm. Um, you know, we knew that we were going to be growing our family and so a two bed wasn't really an option because we'd get that and need to kind of upsize quite quickly. So we just started looking further afield to see how much we could get for our money. And with that, um, then realizing that we could take money out of the flat it wasn't going to cost any you know anything big to do that we wouldn't need to have money that we had saved to put into another property it just all seemed so easy Stephanie <laughs> it really seemed so easy and so we were able to buy our residential using some of the equity from that property and um, just continued from there really wow so that really helped you upscale your life and then then you added further to your uh, investment portfolio but i know that what listeners will be particularly interested in today is how you're working with what what got you into uh, rent to rent with supported living first of all let's start from there okay so when i um decided that i was going to start my own business um i knew that i could go and rent a property somewhere somehow and I didn't have to buy it so I just started networking with loads of people I was part of a business um, mentoring community so everybody in that community knew what I was doing and knew what I was trying to get set up and property seemed to be a bit of a, a hurdle I suppose because none of the properties within my portfolio kind of fit the bill in terms of what it was that I uh, was looking for and so I had to get something a lot bigger um so I was just networking networking like crazy going to loads of events this is pre-corona if anyone can remember those days I was going to loads of events I was speaking to loads of people and then in the end it turns out that somebody within my mentoring community um had been introduced to a landlord who had um quite a large portfolio of property they had a hmo that had just become available he's into the so my friend who was part of the mentoring community is more into the serviced accommodation space he wanted to go and look at the property and meet the landlord anyway and just said to me come along you might as well meet her and the property may work for you now on that particular day my daughter was off um was off nursery she wasn't feeling very well i was in two minds about whether i wanted to go and look at this property because i'd already seen so many and the minute you say to a landlord um this is what i do it's for the purpose of providing accommodation for young people the price goes through the roof so something that they may have been prepared to let for let's say two thousand is suddenly five thousand six thousand it was just like come on they're taking the me <laughs> yeah but honestly why would the, why would a landlord think that you could get so much more if there's young people in it because everybody's got this preconception about how much money providers make. So oh. if there is, as a provider, you're going to be making, you know, tens, thousands of pounds every single month. So I want a piece of that. And that's how a lot of landlords that I was coming across were approaching the situation. 
I met another landlord who had a really nice um, HMO property in a really lovely area. She asked me for full rent and 40% of my profits. Wow. I was like, wow. So by the time I got to this property, I'm, you know, if I'm honest, I was fed up. I was like, oh, it's probably not going to work out anyway. The landlord's probably really greedy and is going to try and extort me for every penny. Um, but you know what? I'm not one to kind of miss an opportunity. I thought if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But let me go along anyway. And that turned out to be the house. The landlord was very understanding. She totally understood the model. You know, she just wants to get the property let because, you know, as long as it's sitting empty, she's not getting any income. Um, it was HMO ready. It had furniture. So I didn't have to do any of that. It was in a location that I was already really familiar with. Um, so in my previous role, I had been managing supported housing in that particular borough and the house was round the corner from one of our old services. So it just it just it ticked all the boxes. It, it seemed to work really well for me. So I was like, yep, I'm going to go for this one. And and that's what I did. Oh, I, I love the, the story and the drama. And that's when so many people give up at that moment where I've done this so often. I don't want to see another one. <laughs> But then that day when you picked up your sick daughter, you went out with her, <laughs> took her to this viewing. And because uh, I'm guessing she went with you, did she? Yeah, she did. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, they're sick. And then the minute they're not at nursery, they're fine again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've, been, we've, we've all been there. Uh, so, so you went to this house. And um, let me just ask you, because that was interesting. So you were introduced to this property by somebody in, in a mentoring group. These mentoring groups are so powerful. So did you pay them a sourcing fee or didn't pay a penny no introduction fee no sourcing fee i've always said to him i owe him a drink yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. and i still owe him a drink and he knows that drink's there waiting for him but yeah. um no. so he didn't do it because he was trying to get anything out of it it was purely i really like what it is that you're trying to do for young people come along with me this property may work for you and that was it yeah, it's just friends, really. So I, I was just curious on that. And then you've got this property now. So tell us, give us an idea. I know you may not want to talk about the exact figures, but just give us an, an idea of the border part because people may not understand how supported accommodation works. So what were you paying for the property in rental? So for the first one, I managed to negotiate 2,300 per calendar month. Um, and it's a five bedroom HMO. It has a license. It had, you know, all the compliance features that it needed and it was already furnished. So, you know, I was not really having to do very much to kind of get myself in a position where I was ready to go. So it seemed like a really good deal for me at that time. Great. And I know there's some complexities um, to how you work out the income because you get paid at different times for different people. But just on an average, what would what would the uh, income be on something like that? So hmm, income really is dependent on the type of service that you are running. And this is where a lot of providers sometimes go wrong because they listen to what their friends say and they get really excited about numbers. And then they find that they've overcommitted to a property where they're paying too much in rent. So I just want to say that to put that into perspective. Now, if you're running a service where you are staffing the home on a 24 hour basis, um, you know, you're generally going to be working with your 16 and 17 year olds. It's really intensive. So my biggest expense is going to be staff wages. So, yes, you get a nice um, income for each young person that you're providing a service to, but you're spending a lot as well in terms of staff wages. The other type of service that you can provide is more more of a HMO, traditional HMO model for young people. So that's generally the ones who are 18 to 24. They're able to live a lot more independently and they don't need staff on site 24 hours a day. So for that type of model, you could be looking at roughly three fifty to four fifty for each young person a week. So depending on how many young people you've got in that house, that would determine how just much. Just give us an average. Just give us an average on a five bed for a month. Sorry, I can't do weekly. <laughs> yeah, we work in weekly figures. <laughs> I do. Well, I can work it out. 
Um, but carry on, carry on. Yeah, so, I mean, very, very um, uh, ballpark figure. You could be looking anything from 1500 to maybe £3,000 a month. After all the costs? after the costs and that's yeah. on a non 24 hour service if you're providing a 24 hour service then it's 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 more than that yeah so what did you say 1500 to 3000 yeah about that yeah yeah and i know that for the other one i believe it's uh you can get anywhere from 3000 to 7000 potentially <laughs> on the 24 hours it can be anywhere between 3,000 and 7,000 in cash flow and on the non-24 hour it can be anywhere between uh, 1,500 and 3,000 but it really does depend on the type of um, residence you have yeah absolutely it depends on the local authority you're working with the type of young people you're working with the support package that you've um agreed to provide so you know some young people will be minimal support some it will be a lot more so there's so many variables and that's why i don't really like to give figures because what i get might be very different to what the next provider gets yeah yeah but it's i'm so glad you did though because it just gives people a, a broad brush understanding and also we can see there in those figures why property investors I know you say it's not a property strategy but why <laughs> property investors get so excited about supported living because not only is it a chance to do good and have your property business actually be doing good in the community and and serving people who struggle to find beautiful mm -hmm. affordable accommodation um you also it's also great for business as well so I'd love to talk to you now about what are the biggest mistakes that you see people making when they're getting started in supported living? Oh, the number one biggest mistake that they make is that they rush to go and take on a property. That is not the first thing that you need to do. I get so many calls on a weekly basis. Bianca, I've set myself up as a provider, but I'm struggling to get referrals. If you're struggling to get referrals or you're not getting referrals, you have not set yourself up as a provider because it's only at the point at which you become a provider that you get the referrals. But a lot of people seem to think all they need is a property and then they can phone up the council and say, hi, I've got a property. Can you send me some young people? It absolutely does not work like that. So when I take on mentees, for example, they're like, oh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to go and get a property. I'm like, no. Don't do anything, do not do anything until we've started working together. I much prefer working with a blank canvas so that I can stop any mistakes being made. There's so much work that you can do before you get to the point where you need to take on the expense of a property and that rent and all the other things that come with it. So yeah, that would be the biggest mistake that people make. Yes. and. What would you say is the best way to get started? If somebody was listening to the, to this and thinking, "Wow, I would like to I would like to get started in supported living because because the advantage is is that you've always got talent demand. Um, so what, what what would you say advice? Well, I would say get yourself a mentor, and it doesn't you know it doesn't have to be me but get somebody who's a few steps ahead of you and can talk you through and coach you through the process of becoming a provider because if you do not get this right I'm telling you you're gonna cry <laughs> you are going to cry I get people coming to me all the time and their properties have been sat empty for you know going on two years in some cases because they haven't taken the steps that they've needed to take so I would say get yourself a mentor, somebody who's a few steps ahead of you, who's already been through the correct process and they are now operating as a provider. There's lots of people out there mentoring and um, claiming that they can help people become providers. But unless you're doing it yourself, I think you're actually doing your clients a disservice because things are changing all the time and even when I set myself up last year and went through quality assurance with certain local authorities things have changed now and sometimes my mentees are saying oh but I'm being asked for a b and c and I wasn't asked for those things when I did it just a year ago so get somebody who's a few steps ahead and can take you through that process and stop you from making unnecessary mistakes that's brilliant and Bianca you have 
uh, you help people find out how to become a provider as well. I'm very interested in this. So t talk us through um, what, you, what, you, what you can help people with. Okay, so generally people come to me because uh, word of mouth generally, they've heard about something that I do or they've heard about what it is that I'm doing and I'm quite um, active on social media as well. So they come to me usually in distress because they've got a property, they're paying for it, it's empty and they don't know how to get in with the local authorities. So what I do is I deliver a consultation. It's a good, you know, three hours of me just delivering information and taking them through each of the steps that they themselves need to follow. There's so many different considerations that need to be taken into account. So I'll go through the consultation process with you. I'll deliver you loads of content and then I'll leave you with a checklist of things that you need to now go away and do. Um, there's a lot of work involved to becoming a provider. So once you've got your checklist and you're happy to go away and, and you know, crack on with the tasks, um, you know, you can do that. And if you're confident that you know what you're doing at that point, then absolutely fine. A lot of people still find that they need more of a handholding service. So only after they've done a consultation do I then accept them onto my mentoring program. Um, it's it's, it is generally one-to-one -one mentoring, but I do have a WhatsApp group because I think you you really gain something from being in a group with other people who are in a similar stage to you. You know, if one mentee's got a question, it's the answer to that question is going to help everybody. So I do have a group WhatsApp, but I do a lot of work with my mentees on a one-to-one -one basis. And just as an, um, an additional value add, I do a group Zoom once a month as well. And that's where I'm delivering content and information because they don't know what they don't know. So I'm telling them things that they are going to need to know as they are going through that process. And it's working yeah. really well. So I've had quite a number of mentees who are now operating as providers in their own right. So, yeah, it's going really well. Yeah. And you said that they're doing it all over the country. Tell us the locations of some of your mentees who have recently got up and yeah. running. So uh, Manchester, Nottingham, Birmingham, um, Norfolk and Su Suffolk. <laughs> wow. Uh, Kent, uh, Medway, literally all over. Mm -hmm. I mean. There's young people all over the country, you know, they're not isolated to just London. There are, unfortunately, these social care issues all over. And so, yeah, um, I literally help people wherever they are. Great. And um, how much money do you need to get started in this, Bianca? I generally advise having about six months worth of expenses so again i can't give a, a flat figure because what you pay in rent may be different to what somebody else pays in rent but if you've got about six months worth of expenses i think that's going to put you in a nice strong position and you follow what i tell you to do if you go off track and do it your own way you might end up having to um it may take you longer to get those young people through the door yeah no this this sounds so good. So what sort of people, because I'm guessing that this type of business is right for some people and not right for other people. How do you determine, like if somebody was listening and say, I wonder if this is right for me, what, what sort of questions would you ask yourself, uh, Bianca? So whenever I'm approached by um, somebody who wants to set themselves up as a provider, I always ask what their professional experience is. Because if they're a plumber, um, a property entrepreneur, um, but they've never kind of engaged with young people before, then unfortunately that doesn't really work for me. I need them to have some kind of experience with working with young people. Um, and it can be in a range of capacities. You don't have to be a social worker. You, you know. I've had teachers, I've had social workers, I've had nurses, mental health nurses, probation officers, um, um, loads of different professions, but those types of professions that give you access and experience with young people. If you don't have any of that, it's going to be a struggle. And what about, could you not, or could you buy those services in, work with somebody who is very experienced in those areas if you don't have those skills yourself? Yes, you absolutely can, but they would need to come on board right from the beginning. So then that's an additional expense. So if you're willing to pay for um, buying in that, that level of expertise, um, then yeah, 
fine. And there are some people I've had to say, you know, go away and find somebody that can help you with this because the information that I'm going to, what I don't do, Stephanie, is I don't set the business up for anybody. I literally give them the instructions and tell them what they need to do, but I'm not going to do it on their behalf. And so they need to have somebody on the team who can, um, you know, take the information that I'm giving, implement it and then become a provider. Um, so, yeah, that's that's how I work. They need to have experience or bring in some expertise into the business. And why do you like being a supported living provider? What are the advantages of being a supported living provider rather than just continuing with what you were doing, which was the uh, single buy to lets? Um, well, they're two very different things. So single buy to lets is something that I think I will always do anyway, because I want to grow my asset column. I want to, um, you know, we're talking about generational wealth at the moment. So I want to make sure that, you know, for my generations, I've got something there for them. Um, so I will always do the buy to lets. But for me, that's very passive. Um, it's a bit boring <laughs> even if i had a hundred by to lets i mean that's not going to keep me busy it doesn't give me any great sense of purpose i would be bored i'm somebody who's very active i like to be quite hands-on and so i like you know what i've done in setting up my business is i've literally exchanged my nine to five for another nine to five it's just that i own this nine to five and i can work on my own terms a lot more um but i'm very active in my business this is the work that i've always known it's what i enjoy it gives me a huge sense of satisfaction and um yeah for the moment this is what i enjoy doing with my with my day to day Great. Uh, it's just so good to see. I can see that enthusiasm just spilling out over you. And so mm -hmm. I just want to also understand what are the drawbacks and the challenges and the things where you think, oh, I wish I wasn't doing this. Maybe you never wish that. But what are the drawbacks with supported living, do you think? No, I'm really glad you asked that question, actually, because last week I had a really, really tough week. And you do get this when you're working just with people in general, never mind young people who have sometimes behavioural issues, they're carrying trauma, um, you know, things happen. We're dealing with real life situations. Um, so some of the things that, you know, you do face as a provider that can be a bit frustrating, repair issues. So I've had quite a number of doors broken down in the last uh, week or so. Um, you know, <laughs> a young person who for some reason can't get into their bedroom, they've lost their key, their key's not working, rather than phoning the emergency line so a member of the team can come along and give them access, they'll kick the door down and then they'll phone and say, oh, I'm really sorry, I've had to kick my door down why didn't you make that call before <laughs> we could have come and you know help that situation so the repairs can sometimes be um high um and that can be a bit of a frustration but you know these are things that you expect when you're working with young people and you're working in these types of services the other thing that people should know is although um you get paid really well you don't get the benefit of a deposit you don't get any rent in advance it's not like delivering um a, a, you know a property a house um, a housing to you know your private tenants there's no payment in advance sometimes your payment's not going to come for three, four, five, six months. And so you have to be able to keep the business going. You've still got to pay your landlords, you've still got to pay your utilities, and you've got to pay your staff. Now, I remember back in December, I was waiting for some money to come through, and I was looking at my account thinking, I'm not going to be able to pay the rent the utilities and the staff wages if this money doesn't come by, you know, next week. Thankfully, the money came in time. Yeah. But you know, it, yeah, it's it's one of those things that people don't think about. And then you find yourself in a situation where, yeah, the money's not there. <laughs> but uh, um, I'm glad you mentioned that. Just a quickie, when you have a repair like that, where somebody's opened the door with their foot, um, <laughs> do you get re reimbursed from that, from the council or? No. Ah, right, okay. 
for some providers might be fortunate and they can charge it back to the local authority but in most cases that's not going to happen you as the provider need to meet the cost of that repair bill now what i do with my young people is i make them make a contribution so if they mm. cause damage and it's in the kind of behavioral agreement that they sign up to in the beginning if they cause damage to the property we will ask for a contribution. Now they don't have to give that contribution, but part of our role is teaching them to be independent and to demonstrate that they've got independent living skills. So if you're living in your own private um, accommodation and you you know, break a window or you break the door, you're not gonna be able to call your landlord and say, can you come and fix it please? So I'm teaching you from now, while you've got our support that if the you know i said to my young person right it costs 30 pounds to replace whatever it is that's broken how much are you going to pay and i and he offered 20 out of the 30 pounds and i was happy with that because he didn't actually have to offer anything but it showed that he was willing to take some responsibility so it's a teachable moment so when those things happen i just turn it into a teachable moment I'm so glad I asked that question because I nearly skipped past that, but I was just curious for my own information. But what I what I what I love about your answer is it just really shows you why you're doing why you're in this business, because you are helping the young people and they won't in many cases have had these lessons and learnings as they were growing up. Yeah. And so now this is a place and a space where they're experimenting, but you're also teaching, learning, supporting, encouraging them. So yeah, I think great insight into, into what goes on. I'm sure there are many hair, hairy moments. <laughs> but I'd love to know because obviously you've got this incredible business. You've got your assets from your buy-to-let portfolio. You've got your cash flow um, coming from this business. What are your visions for the future, Bianca? Um, to just keep growing my portfolio, really. So um, as we speak, I'm having my loft converted. <laughs> I've been taking all the, the lessons that um, I've been learning on Clubhouse. And now I'm going to start adding value because I've been quite lazy with my buy to let. So I've grown the portfolio, but I've not really done anything with them in terms of adding value and uh, you know add, adding value to them. They've just been kind of sitting there and you know, I haven't forced the appreciation. So I'm now going to start adding value where I can to the existing portfolio, using the cash flow to buy more um, assets where I can. Ultimately, I would like to own the properties rather than doing the rent to rent um, or mix it. You know, it doesn't have to be one or the other. You can do both. So I'll probably continue to do both, but it'd be nice. I'm quite um, hot on ownership. So I would like to own some of the properties that I'm using for the business. Yeah, I think we're all hot, hot on ownership. Um, <laughs> but what I love, what I love with rent to rent is it just allows you to get that kickstart because you wouldn't have be able to have the business that you have right now and the cash flow that you have right now and create the amazing impacts that you create for the young people if you if you weren't having the rent to rent model. And then I suppose the next step, as you're saying, is to move on so that some of the um, supported living properties are are owned uh, as well as rent to rented. But as we come to a close, it's been such a fascinating interview um, it, or discussion, should we say, today. I'm so glad that you were able to join us. So Bianca, is there any um, advice, inspiration? What message would you like to leave people with today? Well, oh, well, firstly, Stephanie, thank you for having me. <laughs> I don't really um, tend to agree to doing uh, podcasts and interviews because I'm not really one for speaking about myself. But no, thank you for having me. Um, I would say, I mean, I've learned so much about business, about scaling a business. And I think it's really important that if you have an idea um, or if there's something that you want to do, something that you're passionate about, you just get started. I did not have all the answers when I first started and I made a, you know, a couple of mistakes along the way. Um, but you just have to get started and things will fall into place and you'll learn as you kind of go. Um, you don't have to have all the answers. It doesn't have to be perfect, but get started and uh, things will fall into place. So, yeah, that's what I would encourage everyone to do. And also get a mentor if you have something like that available to you in your industry. Really, really important. 
Oh, I love that, 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 those nuggets of wisdom there at the end, just get started. Things will come together. And that's exactly what you did 10 years ago. You were a single mom of a two-year-old because you'd been saving. You were, you read that book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then you bought your first buy-to-let property at a time when I know from our previous conversations, some of your friends were saying, don't do it, don't do it. And that kicked you off to the portfolio you owned and later on has sparked this incredible business that you now have, that you're giving so much help and support to so many young people. So I just want to commend you on all your achievements and the inspiration of the way you got started and also the way you keep going. It's, it's an absolute pleasure getting to know you and uh, I'm so glad that you can join us today. Thank you, Stephanie. So thank you also for watching and for listening. Thank you, Bianca, for joining us on the show and imparting your wisdom. So I will see you all again next time. And until then, remember, believe bigger, be bolder, be a game changer. See you soon. Bye for now.